Welcome back to Screen Time. I'm Ro Khan. Hi, I'm Richard Roper. Been waiting for this for 50 years. <laughs> the anniversary of arguably the greatest film of all time. We will debate that. But first, let me tell you that Screen Time with Rowan Roper is brought to you by AmericanEagle.com. The digital landscape is changing rapidly. And to compete in today's business environment, you need an experienced partner. Since 1995, AmericanEagle.com has partnered with companies of all sizes, offering web design, development, e-commerce, mobile apps, digital marketing. It all serves your business success because they believe that today's online world is your opportunity. Visit AmericanEagle.com today to get started. I believe in America. America has made my fortune and I raised my daughter in the American fashion. I gave her freedom, but I taught her never to dishonor her family. She found a boyfriend, not an Italian. She went to the movies with him. She stayed out late. I didn't protest. Two months ago, he took her for a drive with another boyfriend. They made her drink whiskey, and then they tried to take advantage of her. The first time you see The Godfather, and that scene fades up from black, Mm -hmm. you realize in 10 seconds that you are watching the greatest film you've ever seen. Couldn't agree more. And one of the 500 brilliant decisions made by Francis Ford Coppola and everybody else involved with the film was they start, as you mentioned, we, you know, we start on black and we, we hear somebody talking about how they believe in America. And it turns out it's the undertaker. It's not a major character in the film. It's one of the people that comes to Don Vito Corleone on his daughter's wedding day. Cause the tradition is you can ask for a favor and he wants uh, revenge and retribution for horrors inflicted upon his daughter. But it's just, you know, it just gives you an idea that this is going to be, I always call it the great American novel, even though it's actually a, a movie, but it's based on a novel. Cause it's about the American experience. And of course it's about the mob, but it's really about so much more than that. It's about immigration and assimilation and it's about generational business and, and warring factions and loyalties and all of that. Everything. I, all the Shakespearean elements. Right. But put into this badass movie that the first one set from 1945 to 1955. By the way, it's a period piece because it came out in 72. Right. I always say that you can learn an MBA worth of material by just watching The Godfather. You see how business is conducted. You see how, and not necessarily in bloodshed, Mm -hmm. but it's the same thing corporately. Sure. And the way that communication styles work. It is one of the most all-encompassing, engrossing films. I mean, it is close to three hours. Yep. And it flies by. And when it's over, you wish there were more. And then, then of course, they gave us more. There's a lot more. Yeah. yeah. And, and we've gotten, a, we've uh, been gifted with various versions and extended cuts and a chronological version and the trilogy and the saga. When we talk about the greatest movies, I do say, though, it's Godfather, Godfather 2, and Godfather 3 are three separate films. And I, I know I disappoint people a lot because get asked this question every day of my life what's your favorite movie when i say the godfather because everyone's like well that's mine too and i'm like there's a reason you know (laughs) that's true Uh, and listen you could make arguments for a hundred other films easily as being the greatest film people could say citizen Mm -hmm. kane was the most influential there are tons of other films i know you're a huge hitchcock fan and his movies have climbed up the list of the greatest films as time has gone by and he's you know because he didn't even get an oscar for directing when he was right. you know, making these amazing films. And now there's probably 10 in the top 100, right? Right. Uh, but I think The Godfather, I'm with you, Ro, and I, I always look at it this way too. If I were to teach a film class or take a film class and they're only going to have one movie in the entire semester, what's a movie you could spend a semester on? It's oh, The Godfather. There are others sense. again, but as you mentioned, because it's just the tapestry is so rich and everything about it is amazing. Uh, we're going to go through, I'm going to go with you through this row. You know a lot of this stuff, but just for folks that are remembering and loving The Godfather, this was not a slam dunk at the time, of course, when they were going to make this movie, this this big Hollywood mobster movie. Francis Ford Coppola was from this generation with Lucas and Spielberg, Brian De Palma, all these kind of you know new wave filmmakers who were going to make easy writer type of movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we're starting to do that. You know, before they got into blockbuster Star Wars and all that kind of thing, you know, anti But all of those were, 
in their own way anti Hollywood establishment when they did it. Star Wars was revolutionary when it came out. The Godfather was a take on this genre that was uh, the mobster genre had been around since the movies, yeah. right? It, were invented essentially. Yeah. And the, this genre and the way that they humanized and the the deci- the decision to do close ups and the decision to open, like we just said, open mm. with with a scene that is so that takes you sets you up and then it has to get explained later on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like Sunset Boulevard in that respect, right? Guys floating in a pool. Now let's go tell the yeah, story. Yeah. Right? No, you're absolutely right. And, you, and that's, I think what Coppola knew he could do something different with this. And Mario Puzo, who wrote the novel was going to work with him on it, but still, you know, at the studio, there was a lot of concerns about this. And then of uh, course, the, all the casting, they wanted Lawrence Olivier to play Don Corleone. They wanted, you know, Ernest Borgnine was talked about, you know, Marlon Brando at the time was in a huge slump. He was not Marlon Brando anymore. Uh, and then same thing with the, some of the with some of the uh, sons. There was talk of Robert Redford, of Ryan O'Neill, of you know, established mainstream stars. Not this runt Al Pacino, uh, Robert Evans, the producer of the film, was like, wh- wh- what is this little? No one's going to believe this, and they weren't that thrilled with James Caan. And now, of course, when you look at it in retrospect, it's perfect casting throughout, yes. right? Yes. I mean, well, you know what I, I always tell people to do which I don't know if you can do anymore, if you still have a DVD player. Mm. And if you don't, you might want to get one just for this. <laughs> you get a DVD player and you put on the secondary audio mm. and there are discussions, as Francis Ford Coppola does it, in which they talk about the decisions that were made for each scene. Yeah, And it is like 1 million percent fascinating because the best story to me in this was the infamous scene in which Michael Corleone has to go shoot Salazzo and the police captain. McCluskey. Yeah. Yeah. Much of the Godfather was shot in New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In studios there and on the street and all those scenes in Staten Island Island where the, where the house was, all those things. Yep. So they found this little fern bar Hmm. to shoot that scene. That was an old Italian restaurant. And it had been, it went, so it had all of the bones and structure of an old Italian bar and restaurant, but uh, you know they had to make it look like it again, and it had like uh, wood floors. So they wanted to put down linoleum mm-hmm. to make it look like it would have looked like in the 1940s. Right. And they spent all this money to do it because yeah. Coppola demanded that they were going to do this mm. shot. So they send the rushes back, the, the daily shots, back to Robert Evans who was at that point representing Gulf Western, which owned uh, Paramount yeah, okay. at the time, which was an oil conglomerate, yeah. right? And they he had bosses that didn't understand what, what the movie industry was all about. Mm. They just liked the fact that film is is an oil derivative, so they wanted <laughs> to be a part of it. Profits, profits, too. <laughs> so right, so, so uh, they, they get the dailies back, and they never show the floor. <laughs> so... Evans has to call Coppola and say, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. We need a shot of the floor. You spent yeah. <laughs> $20,000 redoing a floor, and it's not in the picture. That's amazing. So they had to go in, and you'll, you'll notice when he drops the gun, to- <laughs> that's a, that that moment when he it, you know throws the gun down is a, is an over-the-head shot that shows a linoleum oh, floor. That's, wild. that's a real money shot yes. in like three different ways. And I, I could be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure that Michael Corleone, we, those are the only two people he kills by his own hand in the entire Godfather saga. I could be wrong. Someone will let me know, but I'm pretty, I mean, he orders, obviously, yeah. the killings, you know, the, the, you know, there's the famous baptism sequence, there's his own brother, Fredo. I mean, he, you know, he issues the order many times, but right. I think that's the only time. Yeah. And the same thing with Don Vito Corleone. Now, in Godfather 2, in the flashback sequences, we still we see that one scene where he kills the local kind of neighborhood boss, right? right. And he's got the towel wrapped around his gun and the mm-hmm. towel catches on fire. But in most cases, these guys don't inflict the violence personally. They they send out the issue of the order. They're generals, right? They send it to their captains, if you will. I mean, there's all that kind of, and you the, know, that military bullshit that surrounds the mob where they act as if they're royalty and the families, the five families and all that. You know, when you watch The Godfather, the first time you watch The Godfather, you don't think about the violence. Maybe because so many more films have been so much more violent yeah. since it was made. Yeah. But you, it's a family story, you know? It, yeah. it doesn't 
feel like a murder mystery or a murder uh, procedural. It feels it, it it feels like you know you're watching these guys. I'm more interested in them eating. And, you know, or sitting around and, and discussing things like whether the Chinese food in when they're discussing yeah. Yeah. Michael going out to kill those guys or that, that's it, it, more menacing and chilling because of the matter of fact way they go about their business right. talking about who's going to die, who's going to get killed. Right. I agree. And when you do see the violence, you know, the shootings here and there, the you know stranglings, it's pretty quick. I mean, it can be it's very graphic for the time or very sudden, but. Uh, you know, the big exception to that would be, you know, when when Sonny gets it in the causeway, because that's one of the that's pure Bonnie and Clyde stuff there. They right. really went all out there with 400 squibs and it cost, I think at the time, like 200 grand or something to film that scene. The equivalent of about like 800 grand these days over three days It was very detailed. Uh, you know, and you watch it to this day and you're like, holy shit, it, it is still one of the most shocking and stunning scenes. But I'm with you. I think, you know, a lot of it, there were notes from the studio at times saying, like, we need even more of that action. Is this an action movie? And it's, well, no, not for the next 25 minutes. It's going to be all this dialogue, you know, which is what makes it so great. And then Sonny beats the shit out of the, you know, brother-in-law with the garbage can lid. Yeah. <laughs> and he really did Or then Luca Brasi sw- <laughs> sleeps with the fishes. Yeah, and there was a lot of that too. They said when Brando, what's his name, Johnny Fontaine, the, the Sinatra singer, when he slapped him, that wasn't in the script. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to talk to you too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like I can see Brando. Oh, you'll be okay. Uh, or Brando, and everybody knows the stories about Brando. The studio didn't want him, and then he killed in the audition. Uh, and he, he won Best Actor, by the way, if, if people don't know. He refused the Oscar, but he's still the winner of yeah. the Oscar. Mm-hmm. He was 47 at the time when he when he did the role. We were just talking in the last podcast about ages and how you can play Hollywood tricks with him and everything. I did look it up. He, that makes him the same age as Leo DiCaprio is right now. Bradley Cooper, also 47. <laughs> you know, so you're like, wow. wow. <laughs> you know, and and that yeah. time, oh, Brando, he's old, washed up, has been. He can't take on this role. He's 47. Yeah, you know, yeah, and and he won the Academy Award. And one of the things I learned, Ro, you probably knew this, but when we were just researching this podcast and I was rewatching the film, okay, so Marlon Brando didn't go to the Academy Awards and sent an activist by the name of Sashin Littlefeather up in his steed to say that he was declining it because of Hollywood's treatment of Native Americans mm-hmm. uh, through the decades. But Al Pacino also boycotted the Oscars, and I didn't know this until I read about this recently. Uh, and he boycotted because he felt he shouldn't have been nominated in the best supporting category because he has more screen time than Brando does. And he wanted to be nominated for lead actor. So he didn't go. He boycotted for that reason. I know Duval and I think John Cazale were nominated as well. None of them won in the best supporting actor category, which well, is incredible. Well, they split it all up. Yeah. yeah. And when you think about it, and then two years later, he didn't. Al Pacino never won for playing Michael Corleone. Arguably the greatest performance of the most intriguing character in cinematic history. Mm-hmm. He was nominated for supporting actor and actor. And he didn't win either time. Hollywood really fucked that up. You talk about snubs and misses and stuff. Right. And they, you know, and the Oscars did go to Best Picture and Screenplay and things like that. And, of course, Marlon Brando. But it should have won all the Oscars, even if it wasn't nominated in a category. Right. Well, and that is the truth, though, of the Oscars. And as much as we, in the last podcast, we talked about you know, sort of at least it is like a gold standard, literally yeah. and figuratively, for the motion picture industry. Uh, it's very political, right? It, and there's a reason is. they yeah. do that. They wanted, you know, Brando was a name. Pacino at that point there's not a name. was no, not a name. No, you're right. So you're not going to put him up for best actor yeah. because people aren't going to vote for him. So you, so because they make that choice. Yeah, they were actually doing him a favor in terms of marketing or trying to get uh, Al Pacino an Oscar because everybody, by the time, after the film came out and became a monster hit and almost universally praised, then everybody said it was genius to have Marlon Brando play the Godfather, and everybody knew he was going to win for Best Actor. So Al Pacino didn't want to be in that category. Uh, but I will say this. For supporting actor, the winner that year was Joel Grey for uh, Cabaret. And uh, all great respect to Joel Grey. Yeah, and it was a great and, performance. And a, and a great performance. When was the last time you, talk, you heard anybody, i got to rewatch Cabaret from 72, man, and Joel <laughs> Grey supporting actor performance. You know, it, 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 And then two years later... So in 1974, a great performance, Art Carney, who was best known from The Honeymooners, right. you know, 25 years before The Godfather, beloved actor, mostly known for comedy. Then he does Harry and Tonto. Uh, one of them was a cat. I don't know if Harry, I think Harry was, he was Harry, Tonto was the cat, I'm pretty sure. Hoping, yeah. But it's the kind of Lion in Winter's, you know, acting job that the Academy loves. So they gave it to, the first time they gave it to the showbizy cabaret 
standard musical, even though it's, you know, crazy material, but it's cabaret. You know, right. it's pretty mainstream. Yep. And then they gave it to the veteran actor. So in both cases, it's like, again. Still missed. You know, yeah, no, again, I don't know. I've never has anybody said to me, there's a Harry and Tonto uh, film club. <laughs> And we all watch it once a year. And I'm not I'm not putting down the film or the actor or the performance. I'm just saying what has lasted yeah. generationally and resonated. Right. It's Michael Corleone and it's Al Pacino's performance. Right, right. And it was able to translate to a sequel, which is arguably as good. Yeah. Some people say better than The Godfather. Yeah. I don't think it is, but I, I, I adore that one recut of both films that does it chronologically you mentioned yeah. earlier because they add other material and that's like a festival day like yeah. you can put that on at i, I suggest like 10 o'clock in the morning so that you can you know be done by five <laughs> in the afternoon yeah. Yeah. but you can watch that for seven hours and have that on and just and, and it will it washes over you if there's like a rainy or snowy or whatever and you can't go out and you want to order in Italian food because you do because you get hungry watching that film because there's there's so many food scenes in it. <laughs> All the food scenes. Yeah, it's oh my god, is it great? Yeah, you know that's interesting too because a lot of people you know like purists are like that's not how they were intended but francis ford coppola has been helming all of right. those recuts and refashions and remolding so when it's the creator doing it then it's not sacrilege if somebody else decides to just say hey i'm gonna take it's a wonderful life and i'm gonna run it backwards or something no you can't do that <laughs> you know, you start off with george bailey you know at the end and then how did george get here well, no. no 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 i uh but I, in this I case agree. i agree and I know we got to take a break, uh, but speaking of food, when we come back from the break, I want to talk to you about oranges and The Godfather. But first, Portillo's. They are known for their famous Chicago hot dogs with all the freshest and tastiest ingredients right down to the poppy seed bun. And of course, the legend itself the chocolate cake. If you are hearing this right now, that means you are alive and you are near a computer. Go to Portillo's.com and check out their entire selection of stuff that you can get anywhere in the United States of America. If you are blessed enough to live near a Portillo's, then you don't have to worry about going online. Just go to the store, go get the hot dogs, go get the Italian beef, go get the salads, the chicken, they got, it's all great. But the chocolate cake is is the single greatest item of all chocolate cake items in the history of humanity. Am I overstating that? <laughs> I am not. I am not. You go and you find out yourself. Order it online, go to a store, or if you really want to try something totally unique, the cake shake. They take the cake and they smush it <laughs> into a can with the... With, I don't know what else it is. I guess ice cream and some other stuff. And then they put it in the blender. You know how they do that? Where they yeah. take that cannish looking cup and they put it up into the blender. <laughs> Next thing you know, <laughs> it comes out and they put a cookie on the straw and you're like, oh my God, this oh. is the greatest thing that ever happened. This is a warning to diabetics. It may not be perfect for Good you, Lord. but for everybody else, <laughs> it is the greatest thing you could possibly have. Go to Portillo's.com, find a location near your order online. P-O-R-T-I-L-L-O-S, Portillo's.com. She'd throw it all away just to make me look ridiculous. And a man in my position can't afford to be made to look ridiculous. Now you get the hell out of here. And if that goomba tries any rough stuff, you tell him I ain't no band leader. Yeah, I heard that story. Thank you for the dinner and a very pleasant evening. Maybe your car could take me to the airport. Mr. Corleone is a man who insists on hearing bad news immediately. Okay, that's the scene in The Godfather where Tom Hagen flies to Hollywood, right? And he wants to convince the famed, powerful producer Jack Waltz to cast Johnny Fontaine in this movie. And then he explains he's never going to do it and... and get the hell out of here and blah, 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 and toughest guy in the world. And, of course, next scene he wakes up and there's a horse, his head, <laughs> in his bed. Yes. And, by the way, that was a real horse's head as well that they, they substituted after all the rehearsals with dummies. They got a horse's head from a dog food factory. It was a different time. Uh, and uh, that's what why it looks so realistic and bloody and terrifying because it was, was real. a real horse's head. Oh, God. But what I wanted to talk about here, Ro, was... Uh, 
the oranges. And in the dining room table, on the dining room table, there's a bowl of oranges, giant bowl of oranges. And there's been this theory formed through the decades that anytime you see an orange in The Godfather, something terrible is about to happen. Uh, in the early moments when uh, Don Corleone is with, out with Fredo and he says, I'm going to go buy some fruit, he's looking at oranges when he gets shot. Uh, we just mentioned the dining room table. When the five families get together, there's an orange atop the bowl of fruit on the table. Uh, at Connie's wedding, Tessio, a Vagoda, mm -hmm. uh, is juggling an orange at one point. He didn't last much longer after that himself. You know, Next thing you know, he's in the car going, uh, what about for old time's sake, Mikey? And they say no. And then, of course, famously at the end uh, of Don Corleone's journey, he's in the garden with his grandson, playing with the oranges right he makes the kind of funny mouth thing right. you know this fake smile and everything uh and now there are other cases as well but there's these oranges appearing throughout and, and it does seem like it's a, a you know a harbinger of death yes now the people that have worked on the movie have said that actually that's not true that that just became a coincidence and they they kept adding oranges because of the dark color schemes and the dark lighting the deliberately dark lighting of gordon willis this famous cinematographer as you mentioned, like the restaurant scene, everything is kind of in browns and reds and kind of the sepia Very autumnal dark. thing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to put some color in some of these interior sequences. So what better? Bowl of oranges. And in that era, especially in winter scenes, oranges were not commonly available mm. in winter northern climates. You know, you'd have to go down to Florida mm. to get the oranges and bring them back yourself. You know that's that was uh, that was a, a sign of some you know form of status, yes, of Great economic point. capability. Great point to have oranges, and especially you know what, what was pretending to be a working class family to have that. I, I always read it as that when I would say. I think it. that's a great point because all the things I mentioned, you know, whether it's the five families or a super mega. Hollywood producer, we're talking about people that would have access to things, and that would be one way of demonstrating right. your power and access and wealth was to get something that other Traveled. people couldn't get. Yes. Yeah, travel. Yeah, because yeah. again, we're talking about the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, but fascinating stuff. Look yeah. for the oranges, well, man. Can I go back to yeah. the cinematography here? Yeah. <laughs> what I learned early on while watching The Godfather, I never saw it in the theater. I only saw it yeah. on television, yeah. and then you know eventually we got flat screens, and it was really great. But you know when you first got the DVD of yeah. it or the VHS cassette, I think is where sure. I started with yeah. it, and you'd put it on if it was like a day and there was ambient light in the room, you couldn't see the film. No, that's true. On your TV, you'd have to literally try to make it as dark as possible that's because right. yeah. it is really designed to suck you in. And Gordon Willis again, and he did a, you know so many. Look him up on IMDb mm -hmm. as a cinematographer, mm -hmm. and it, like almost every movie you loved for a thirty-year span, Gordon Willis had something to do with. Yeah, amazing stuff. And you're absolutely right. And it was the you know, deliberate choices, certain types you mentioned, the overhead shots, overhead lighting, and it works beautifully now. But you could again see the studio getting these early rushes and saying, "What am I looking at here?" <laughs> right, you couldn't yeah. see it. And, right. And oh like, my god. I again, again. I think also Robert Evans did that uh, autobiography too. Like the boy stays in the picture, the or whatever it's called. In the picture, the kid stays yeah. in the picture, right? Yeah. And he writes about that as well, and that entire Godfather thing, and dealing with the oil executives to yeah. try to explain to them what it was that they were doing. And it was, it's almost like form and function. It was like what he was going through trying to get this board of governors essentially to go yeah. along with him, this board of directors to go along with him was the same kind of mechanics that the Corleone family had to do to win over New York. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there are occasional outdoor sequences, obviously, the, you know, the big wedding, and it's it's bright uh, when they go to Vegas, although they actually didn't go to Vegas. They made it look like Vegas in the, in the first film. Uh, you know, there are some outdoor sequences, but even when it's sunny, it seems like it's dark in some weird way. And then a lot of times when we're outside, it's raining or it's snowing or it's, you know, deep at night, and it's got that kind of sense of you know, listen we're dealing with a lot of people who are doing a lot of dark and evil yeah. things and there's there's that, that new york sense is of, dark yeah. and cloistered like it can be yeah and the compound you know where the corleone family is living with all the guards and everything you know again yes they have great privilege and wealth and power but it's like a prison it looks like and it is in a lot of ways right. for 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 uh for the kids, for Kay and the kids, there's a famous scene where she tries to leave and they're like, we'll get you anything you want. Yeah. 
with the big, but the big imposing wrought iron gates and the stones and the kind of the snow flickering out there. It never looks welcoming. And their receiving room, you know, sort of like the, yeah. where they would go and meet when they'd first walk in the house. It looked like a funeral parlor. Looked like a funeral parlor, for yeah. sure. And all of that production design is so important on films like this. It was all just brilliantly done. But the sun was always out in Sicily. Yes, that's true. That's true. When you get to Godfather 2, Cuba. You know, what's saying again, there's a different kind of a vibe and a different kind of look, really different look. Yeah. But like everything else in the film, when you go back and look at it and you realize they were doing this, you know, on a relatively limited budget, relatively fast shooting schedule with all these pressures from the studio. The studio originally said, why can't we set this in Kansas City in 1972? Because then we can film it in Kansas City in 1972. Because again, when you're doing a period piece, and they had beautiful wardrobe, but they did a lot of tricks where they would show just a certain portion of a street right. or a neighborhood. You know, obviously with the cars, it's easy to, you know, you can get people in the mood uh, that it's that, you know, but there are a period of time with clothes and cars. It's the first but there, step. there are places in Manhattan that you can still go and they look mm. exactly the same if you're shooting just that block. You know, Radio True. City Music Hall looks exactly the same. There are parts of Little Italy that look exactly yeah, the same. Staten Island point. looks exactly the same in a lot of places. So it, it really, it it was so, um, when, when you look at a creation and you think, okay, how did that come to be? Mm. It didn't just happen you had to have Francis Ford Coppola's vision of mm-hmm. this story. Yeah. You had to have Mario Puzo's, you know, sp- the spine of it. Yep. But Coppola had to make it into a movie. Yep. It's a great book, and it's cinematic in its telling. Sure. But you got to make that work. Yep. And he did in a way that I think in lesser hands or other hands would not in any way be what it turned out to be. If Brian De Palma had done it, and I'm not taking anything away from Brian De Palma, it would have had a very different feel. And I don't yeah, think it would have no, been operatic, right. Yeah. right? You wouldn't have had that, the, you know, the music, the, obviously, the, the music Carmine Coppola's yeah. music. Yeah, the music was huge. And the casting, too, it's, you know, in retrospect, listen, I think a lot of the casting choices might, you know, people go, oh, my God, you know, Robert Redford. Well, Robert Redford's a good actor, and he would have figured out a way to play Michael. It would have been a very different performance. Northern right. Italy, apparently, not from Sicily. Yeah. Or, you know, one of the great veteran actors, you know, Olivier as Don Corleone. I think those types of choices would have made it a much more mainstream movie. Because to your point, Ro, even though this became one of the most popular, biggest movies of all time, it had an indie vibe to it. And a lot of the casting, you know, yeah, we all know now how great they are. But let's face it, they got lucky. Uh, Talia Shire, who is Francis Ford Coppola's sister, had almost done no acting before she played Connie. Uh, Diane Keaton had done some stuff, but she was not any Hall yet. Right. And certainly the same things with you know, Jimmy Kahn, El Pacino. Pacino had done one movie, I think, Panic in Needle Park. There was buzz around these actors, but they weren't stars. Right. And even Robert Duvall, who had been acting for about 10 years, None of them, as you mentioned, were marquee names at the time. So it, it was, you know, Marlon Brando, the formerly great actor, and a bunch of up and comers and a bunch of wily veterans that you probably don't know right. in this film. Almost wasn't all the them star studded cast. It is now. Right. You know? Yeah, and but it almost, wasn't at the time. All of them were stage actors from New York. Yeah. A lot of those guys were found there or and not even Broadway. A lot of these guys were off Broadway actors. Yeah. And then uh, El Martino, of course. Yeah, who, it was a bit of a nightclub act. Yeah, you know? and then a lot of the a lot of the you know old timers in the movie were character actors. A couple of them may or may not have actually been in some organized activities through the years. I'm just saying, you yeah. know. Uh, so again, you know, you don't know that you're going to strike gold with all of these. Uh, character actors some of them have 10 lines but they're you know fantastic and then you so you know when you think about it uh mo green for example uh you know um uh, clemenza you know they have some of the best lines uh this you know guys who have and women who have you know four scenes in the movie but it's you know to, uh, leave the gun take the cannoli it's on mo green you know uh you know all these you all don't these, buy me out yeah all right, i yeah. buy you out yeah I made my bones when you were going out with cheerleaders, he says. So Mike, Michael's looking at him like, I didn't go out with cheerleaders. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but that also just adds to the brilliance of it all, Ro. I do, I do officially declare it the greatest movie of all time. All right. Uh, I don't think 50th you can, anniversary. Uh, it, people can argue with you, but they would be wrong. Yeah. Room for seconds. 
The Road Rover Podcast is brought to you by AmericanEagle.com Studios. AmericanEagle.com is a full-service global digital agency providing best-in-class web design, development, hosting, digital marketing services, and so much more. Visit AmericanEagle.com for more information. I want to thank Renee Nelson and Tim Alanius, our executive producers, and Demita Menezes, our long-suffering producer and audio director. See you next time. <laughs>